I wanted to begin this talk with a question. Have you ever been on a great adventure? Something where you were pushed to the limits? Something when, when something really big happened to you and you emerged a hero, proud of saving the day? Or maybe, maybe that's not how it went. Maybe something kind of bad happened and you, you were on an adventure and, and, and things went wrong. And you got to use those words, epic fail on your status. <laughs> Maybe it was neither of these. Maybe you just did something that you were really proud of, and you got to way, walk away from that experience knowing you'd done your best. I've been thinking about this question a lot lately. I've been asking people, and one of the things that I'd follow up with is, can you tell me more? And boy, could they ever. They'd start out by saying, I remember it vividly like it was yesterday, or I remember exactly where I was when. And then they'd go on, and I couldn't stop them. I'd be stuck there listening to me tell them their adventure, all those little details. What is it about something big like this that makes us remember the small stuff, those vivid details? I had one more question for them. I asked, what did you learn from your adventure? I'd made it to the job interview on time, flying coach to Montreal. And here, I was reading a random bit of text. I felt like I was in grade four again, nervously reading in front of the class, except for the gas mask. <laughs> the next day, I was in an army base in the gym, doing military push-ups. One, one, two. See, they only counted the push-up if you did it perfectly. I felt like apologizing. Not, not just because I'm a Canadian, but because, I mean, <laughs> this was really tough. I was at a military base. There were words like strength and courage on the walls, and I really wasn't doing it for them. See, I'm a physicist. You guys seen Big Bang Theory? Yeah. OK. You know what I'm talking about. So normally, I'd be the first person to tell you having a physicist around is a great idea. But when you're in a gym on a military base, not so much. Might make for a good TV episode, though. I'm, I'm, I'm saving that one. Um, so here I was, trying my best. Now, I flew back after this, back to California, and I waited to see if I was still in the running for this job. When the email came, I was flying again from LAX to Boston to Halifax to a naval base where they were going to test me. They were going to evaluate if I could deal with a hazardous material spill. Sure. They were going to see if I could deal with a room that was flooding and try to contain that flooding on a ship's compartment. And they were going to see if I could try to stifle the flames of a spreading fire. The day after that, I was in this. I remember it vividly. They'd given me instructions that I had to follow. They'd strapped me in, and they lowered me down into the water. As this thing began to sink, it flips upside down so quickly that I only got half a breath. So there I was, upside down, underwater, Eyes blurry, sinuses filling. Conserving what I could of that breath, because I had to wait until they gave me the signal to start my escape. A month after that, the job interview continued. I was in Toronto. I walked out on a stage like this, and opposite me, this firing squad of cameras and reporters. There were 15 other people on stage with me, and then they announced us as the 16 finalists vying for two jobs at the Canadian Space Agency. Job title, astronaut. There was a reporter there, and she said, so out of the 5,351 people who applied, how did you make it here? And she'd, asked, she'd already asked this question. There was an F-16 pilot next to me. And when she asked the question of that F-16 pilot, it was as if she knew the answer. Okay, this guy 
obviously had a place here. He exuded this quality that I like to call insane awesomeness. <laughs> but as for me, a slightly awkward physicist, she was genuinely perplexed. She said, how did you make it here? I wasn't so sure myself. I thought of a plausible answer. I said, well, um, I studied science, I did well at school, it was my schooling, it was my education that got me here. And then I started to think about it, think about that response. I thought about the times when I was in the dunker, I thought about all those experiences, and I was like, you know, my education almost had nothing to do with why I'm here. Maybe it got me that first interview, but it didn't get me anything further. So, what was it? How did I make it here? Well, I started thinking about the experiences that did inform me, and this is one of them. This is a scanning tunneling microscope, and when I started out in research as a young scientist, I built this thing. This was a high-resolution microscope, okay? This could see down to individual atoms. It uses quantum mechanical tunneling, just like that last talk. Okay, this was an amazing instrument, except it was super slow. So what did we do? We souped it up, okay? We added freaking lasers to this thing, okay? <laughs> we made this thing fast by using flashes of laser light, just like a strobe flash, okay? It allowed us to see stuff. To keep the microscope cool, we put it in this big blue thing here. This is a cryostat. Okay? I had used information and knowledge I gained from dozens of courses in order to design this thing. And when we started telling people how it worked, when we started publishing the results, people took notice. So in physics world, they wrote this great article, Microscopy Breaks the Speed Limit. We were on a high, but soon we were knocked right down again. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a hot summer night in June, and a thunderstorm had just been rolling through. I went to remove the microscope out of the cryostat, I lifted it out, and it stuck. Now the problem with this is it was impossible for it to stick. There was no way. It was in a long, straight, cylindrical tube. There was nothing for it to stick on. What I didn't know is that a leak had formed, that ice had started to build up inside that cryostat, and that ice caused a blockage. Pressure was building around a cooling ring inside, and one-third of the way up, that cooling ring collapsed trapping my microscope. I didn't know, but I didn't find out. I wasn't interested. I couldn't conceive of this. I just started pulling it out, twisting, turning, pulling, and suddenly a wire broke. And then another, and then another. The microscope got totaled that night. What does this look like to you? This is a bunch of wires, right? I, I tried to make light of it. I wrote kind of what I thought was a mildly amusing entry in my logbook. But I, I didn't even realize the impact of what I'd done, but later it started to dawn on me. This was over a year's worth of work destroyed. This was the experiments that I built this microscope to do. Those experiments never happened because I didn't think, I just took action. Fast forward 10 years, I was applying to be an astronaut. I was at the controls of the Canada Arm 2 on the International Space Station. This is a simulator, mind you. I didn't get to use the real controls. <laughs> so I was there, and the Canada arm was starting to oscillate. This is something that can go wrong. And I thought about it, and I kind of knew what to do. I had to slow down. I had to calm down. I had to relax, and I had to think about the situation. I also knew the importance of what I was doing, and I knew what would happen if I screwed this up, because I would be out of the competition. So that's what I did. I slowed down, I calmed down, I didn't panic, and I made it through. And this was the reason I'd made it to the finals, because I had the right experiences to draw on. Everyone experiences far more than they understand. It is experience rather than understanding that influences behavior. And this was the answer for that reporter. I had the right experiences. I remember a time getting tangled up in kelp when I was scuba diving. I had to keep calm. I had to get out of that uh, situation. I remember failing a flight test because I got distracted by something that was going on inside the cockpit. I learned from that experience. I remember trying to deal with distraught individuals at a therapeutic riding camp one summer. 
all these things were the experiences that gave me what I needed to go after my dream. Now, about a year ago, I was in a grade nine class and I was sitting in the back. I was gonna be speaking that day. And while I sat there, the teacher was talking, students were taking notes. He was talking about Mars and they were writing down stuff because there was gonna be a test. They wrote down their notes. I started to get bored. I looked around and they were bored too. And then my emotions started to change. I was kind of getting annoyed and frustrated because the information that was being conveyed, what the students were doing and how they had to regurgitate that, I was like, this is kind of like a meaningless experience and I care about Mars. I want to go there someday. Why are these students wasting their time? Why aren't they developing what they're actually going to need if they wanted to apply for a job at JPL? If they wanted to work on curiosity, they needed more than this. So then I thought about it, and I thought, okay, experience is key. How can they develop experiences? And it came to me. The idea, the idea that I wanted to leverage was the idea of the adventure. Why adventures? Because adventures are exciting. They're fun. Sometimes they're a little bit scary. But they always build experience. What kind of experiences could we build? If we give these students an educational experience about Mars, this would be an open-ended activity. There might not be one exact solution, so they're going to have to be thinking outside the box. They're going to have to uh, be developing skills that are going to be with them throughout their life, like creativity, like industriousness, all the things that they're going to need so let's think about that class. And let's look at what another class did. This is at Lord Beaverbrook High School in Calgary. When they studied Mars, they wrote a book about Mars. And they wrote an audio book too. They got astronauts to do the voiceover and they got a musician, Diana Krall, to do the, to do the soundtrack. I don't know how they did all these things, but what I do know is that they worked in teams. You should read the, 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 the final pages of this book. It's like looking at the credits to a Hollywood movie, right? Because they have all these different teams that the students were working on together. There was a science team. And when I read through this, I saw their results. There were facts that were correct, obviously, right? But there was more to that. There was an authenticity to the work because it was informed by the work of the people in, on the science team. There was also the artist team, and they developed the story, the artwork, all the beautiful pictures that you see through this book. They even worked on the script for the narrators and so on. Working on this project, these students experienced a voyage to Mars. This was so much more powerful than what I'd seen before. Then I started to think about what I could do. Now, I'd love to develop educational adventures, but remember how good I was in that gym with those push-ups? <laughs> um, I'm even worse at drawing, okay? I love the work of artists, but I am so bad. You wouldn't believe it. Um, so what I did, uh, this is important to me, I, I actually remember exactly where I was when I called up Luke Gustafson. He's an amazing and talented animator. And working with him, we started hitting it off, and it was like we'd already had the Vulcan mind meld. <laughs> we were on the same wavelength, right? So we started working together. We got some support, a uh, letter of support from the International Space University. We got funding from the Canadian Space Agency and from NSERC. And that allowed us to start working with teachers and scientists and artists to develop our own educational adventures and the Star Racer Academy. I want to turn it over to you. What can you do? Maybe you're a teacher. Maybe you're a parent, maybe you have a young person in your life. What kind of adventures can you help them journey on? Here are some of the amazing resources that you have at your disposal. The Worldwide Telescope, Wikipedia, Khan Academy. Starting on the left, the Worldwide Telescope, this is information, this is data from all of the great telescopes in the world put together, accessed through your web browser. Wikipedia, we all know, it's the source of all knowledge. And Khan Academy, <laughs> Khan Academy, what can I say about Khan Academy? Here's how my grade nine class might begin. You get there early, 
okay, before classes start, because you have to start brainstorming about what you're going to do with this. This is an ArduSat recently funded on Kickstarter. When this launches, it's going to have over 25 instruments on board, Geiger counters, accelerometers, GPS. What are you going to do with this little satellite that is open source, open access, and that you guys can control for your class? So you start brainstorming, and you come up with some ideas, but there's a debate. A debate has erupted in class. There's conflicting ideas because you're wondering, what is it going to measure with that accelerometer? What's the gravity going to be like when this thing is in orbit? Right? You're in orbit, right? So there's zero g, right? But you're constantly changing direction. Maybe you're accelerating. I'm not sure. So what you do is, for your homework, you go surf to Khan Academy, find the video, Gravity for Astronauts in Orbit, and you continue the adventure. You continue to build meeting ever greater and greater challenges. Soon enough, the challenges are so great that you have to start bringing teamwork into play, working with others. You learn how to succeed, and you learn how to fail, and you keep building experience. So the vision I have that I think we should try to bring to the classroom is that we need to teach students we need to impart knowledge to them, but then we have an obligation to create challenges and adventures for them that are going to allow them to develop experience. So that when that big adventure comes and they decide they want to go for it, they want to catch it, they're ready. Thank you. <laughs>